Everybody see that okay? Give me a thumbs up if you can see that. Great. Okay. So let me make just a couple of remarks about uh, the way we'll move forward today and through the class. Uh, and that is, remember the game that we've been playing with texts through the different, um, the different studies that we've done on Zoom. The game is, what do you see? You remember that? Yeah, what do you see in the text? So I am aware of how slowly I teach the Bible. And I think anybody who sat in Huckabee Hall would agree with that assessment. Uh, Cause you just, there's just a lot, there's a lot of richness to unpack. So what I would suggest is that we turn that format so that when I pull up a slide with some text on it, I'll play what do you see first. So I'll go ahead and say the things that have, have come up as I have studied the text. And that way we know that we can move at that clip. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't play what do you see. So my expectation is that as we move along, if you have questions, you'll either drop them in the chat or unmute yourself and sort of wave your hand and speak until you're seen. Um, and, and that's questions or comments or what do you see, any of that. I still, I don't want that to go away at all. Um, it's just that in this format, running through the text sort of line by line, I wanna be sure that we are, um, I wanna be sure that we're getting through each chapter each week. Does that make sense? Okay. So we're studying Paul's letter to the Philippians and we'll get a little more into it being by Paul in just a minute. Uh, this is perhaps uh, one of the snapshots of Philippians that's most well known uh, by readers of the text. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. And I've picked that one because I think it captures what the letter is about. And I think when we talk about the reason for writing the letter, you'll see that that captures what the letter is about. So here we go. But before we go, Remember that I think every time I teach a book of the Bible, I'm going to do this two-minute exercise. Remember what the Bible is not, right? At least from our perspective for this study. Uh, the Bible is not a map. Can you all see that Google map of Chattanooga? And the Bible is not a science book. That's not our approach. So we're not looking at the Bible for specific directions about how to live or how to move every day in every circumstance. And we're also not looking at the Bible for a sort of scientific worldview a way of seeing the world that's informed by the scientific method. And we settled on uh, a couple of years ago when we began to study Mark, the Bible as family album. If you all were sitting in Huckabee, you might remember that. So that's a way of capturing it that says that these are stories about our past told by people from our past. Um, and that in the same way that we may do our family history and sometimes when somebody tells a story about somebody way back in our family, we cringe because that that story reminds us that our family history is not perfect. And sometimes the story is embellished a little bit because we all remember how funny grandfather was about such and such and whatever. But that what these are are the stories that we continue to bring forward from our past that give meaning to where we've come from and where we're going. Right. So I think it's important to do that. I think it's important to do that every time we study a biblical text. And then I proposed for you all uh, in the course of a number of studies that we've done a series of questions that I'm going to answer as an intro to Philippians, and then we'll get into the text itself. And again, if you have questions, stop me, okay? I can only see five of you at once. And so if you unmute yourself and start talking, I'll probably be able to see you, but be persistent. If I don't hear you right off, be persistent. So the first question is, who wrote the Bible? And in fact, I would obviously want to nuance that and remember that the Bible is a series of documents that we've compiled to tell these stories. So the question is not who wrote the Bible. The question is who wrote this document? And the answer is St. Paul. So this is one of those letters that there's really no question among scholars about Paul having written. So you, you'll remember that some of the New Testament uh, First and Second Timothy, for example, are a really good example of this. Um, they start off with a, a prescript that says it's from Paul the Apostle. And the evidence really seems very clear that these, these letters were actually written about the year 100, which would have been uh, a little more than 40, uh, a little less than 40 years after Paul died. So it would have been somewhat hard for him to write a letter 
in the year 100 when he died in the 60s. So this is one of those letters that there's no question about really. Paul wrote this letter. Almost every scholar that I know of agrees with that. And so it might be helpful to think about who Paul is for a minute. So we have the kind of Lutheran view of Paul that says Paul is about grace through faith, right? Saved by grace through faith, not apart from the law. And there are some helpful things about that framework, and there are some unhelpful things about that framework. And I think one of the unhelpful things is that it makes us think that Paul thought like a modern person, somebody who lived after the Enlightenment and was looking at faith as kind of a puzzle that had to be put together. And that's not who Paul is. So Paul is a Jewish teacher. He's a Jewish mystic or maybe an early mystic. Mysticism is not a full-blown thing yet, but Paul certainly has mystical elements in his writings. And we could say more about that um, as we go along. Paul has a vision of the risen Christ. Anybody who's come to uh, the conversion of St. Paul, the, our patronal feast when the bishop usually comes and we read those readings, will remember that Paul's story is he's on the way to Damascus and he has this vision of the risen Christ who comes and says, in Acts, uh, Christ says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? But in some way, Paul has this mystical vision of Jesus risen uh, that really changes his life. I mean, it changes his whole worldview and it sends him around the Mediterranean preaching what he calls my gospel. Paul's gospel, that Jesus is risen from the dead and that Jesus is going to come back to, uh, to bring on the last days, something like that. So Paul, we need to remember, is also apocalyptic. He's looking forward to the end time in a way that we need to keep in front of us because that's not, that's not really the way that we think as a general rule. Um, yeah, that's all I'll say about that for now. So the next question is, to whom was she or he writing? And the answer is the Philippians. So we're really clear about that from the letter, uh, Paul to the Philippians. Philippi is a Roman colony east of Rome. In fact, I think I have a little map that you can look at. How about that? I think I was asked specifically for a map the last time we sat in Huckabee, and I have found a map of the Roman world at about this time. So can you all see my um, pointer like hovering? Can you see when I move that? Oh, good. What a bonus that is. Great. So Rome's over here. Everybody see Rome up in the corner? Right. And there's a real good chance that Paul actually writes this letter from Rome. He may he, he's probably in prison when he writes it. Uh, and there's a really good chance that he's in prison in Rome uh, from some evidence that is not worth spending too much time on, but that I can run down for you privately sometime. Follow me all the way over here to Jerusalem, right? Jerusalem's a pretty famous and important city, lives large in the biblical imagination. So you just need to know that what we call the Holy Land, right? Israel and Palestine is down here. So all the way across the Mediterranean from Rome. And here just about a third of the way between Rome and Jerusalem. Do you see Philippi right there? So that's where Philippi is. It's in Asia Minor. It's a Roman colony, which is important because it's a sort of distinctly Roman city, and that's important. It was settled by actually some Roman troops. Um, one of the, the emperors, or really before they were emperors proper, sent Roman troops to settle Philippi. Uh, after a battle close to there. And so it's got a real Roman identity, and that's important to Paul. And he's writing to a group of Christ believers. Uh, so remember, Paul's gone around and he's preached the gospel. He's preached his gospel sort of all in this area right here at this point. And in the towns that he's left, at least one of them, there's a group of Christ believers who's sort of intensely following him, uh, and that's Philippi. So Paul's going to write this letter to them to encourage them. Uh, well, actually, before I say that, I want to say, remember that we've talked about how it's hard to use the term Christian reliably in the first century, that there's a sense in which we have to talk about people following Jesus, and Christian can be a helpful way to talk about that, but that there's not a real firm separation between Jews and Christians, not a real firm separation until probably 50 years after this letter is written. 
which is why I'll use the term as we go along, Christ believers, because Paul's writing to his, his church, to a group that he's founded of believers in Christ. But it's not Christian in the same way that we think about sort of organized parishes and, you know, common belief, all of that kind of stuff. We're not quite there yet. Paul's writing to a group of people who heard and believed his gospel, and that has caused them to organize themselves in some way. And that's what we are pretty clear about from Philippians. And then the last question is, when did the person write and why? So Paul probably wrote the letter. We can date it internally, probably about 62 of the common era. So if you put that in your head and you think about the fact that Jesus, uh, death and resurrection is typically dated around 30 um, of the common era by most scholars. So this is written about 30 years on from that. And that's important uh, for a number of reasons, but one of the primary ones is this may be the last letter that Paul ever wrote, at least that we have. So pretty soon after this letter, Paul's going to be executed, we think. And what that means is that if you read through the letters of Paul in order, you can see that Paul has his gospel, but that as he sort of faces the circumstances of the world, he begins to develop his thought in some areas. Um, one of those areas that is going to come up in Philippians and be really, really fascinating is what Paul thinks about what it means to be in Christ and with Christ. So his early gospel from something like 1 Thessalonians appears basically to be Jesus is risen as God's representative. He's coming back to inaugurate the last days, something like that. By Philippians, Paul is has a much more personal view of what Jesus is doing in the lives of believers and in the lives of Paul. And we can feel that as we go along. So I think this is a great letter to study to see sort of how Paul's thought has developed and how he's answering some questions that we still have. We still have questions like, what does it mean that Jesus is at work in believers? What does it mean that Jesus is working through the church? So I think it's good to read this letter for that reason. And he's, he writes it for probably three big reasons that we should notice and that we will notice as we go along. So the first one is, this is what uh, a professor of mine, Paul Holloway, would call a letter of consolation. And there's actually a whole genre of this in the ancient world. Seneca uh, and Cicero wrote letters of consolation. So they hear that a friend has had some sort of crisis in life, some deep distress, some really terrible event has happened. And they'll write them a letter to console them. And this feels like what Paul is doing for the Philippians. And the grief that Paul thinks that they're feeling uh, has probably to do with the fact that he's in prison and doesn't know if he's going to get out. So Paul is a really significant figure to them. Paul's who they learn Jesus from. And as they're figuring out how they're going to keep going, they're grieving that Paul seems to be in prison. So this is a letter of consolation. And in the course of that letter, he also wants to encourage them to keep living and focusing on the Christian life, what he's going to call things that the things that matter through the letter. He says that a number of times, the things that matter. And then he also has to thank them for their gift. So apparently, uh, it seems to have been the case that Roman prisoners had to pay for their own upkeep. You all ever heard that before? So in the Roman, in the Roman Empire, if you were imprisoned and you wanted it all to be taken care of, you had to pay for your care. In other words, they weren't going to sort of provide for you. So the Philippians don't know if others did this or not, but apparently the Philippians sent a gift to Paul. He actually mentions it later in the letter to help him keep living, just to provide for his livelihood. And he has to say thank you for that. So he's going to do that in this letter as well. So he's thanking them for the gift. He's encouraging them to keep living the Christian life, and he's going to talk about what that means. And primarily, he really is consoling them about what the future is going to be like, how they, can, they don't have to worry about the future. They can be consoled. Okay. I'm going to stop right there and, and take any questions before we get into the text itself. I know that was a big information dump, and we won't do that every week, but it's important to sort of get in front of us what we're reading here. Joe, I had someone ask me uh, earlier this week, I was talking about uh, uh, you teaching this class, and they were asking me a bit about Paul, and I could not, um, I didn't know really a good answer to this. They were asking me, whose authority was he 
persecuting Christians? Was it Roman authority, Jewish authority? He clearly it, he, he's he's being held by Romans. So in this case, so under whose authority was he persecuting the church um, in that sense? That's an excellent question. And the best answer is we, I don't know that we have any idea. Like I, it's not, it's not the case that there was like a, a kind of Jewish hierarchy at this point. So when we think about church order, um, we think about bishops, we think about headquarters, right? We think about geographical areas and that it's, it's not the case that there was a sort of, um, group of people who were, who were sort of uniformly agreed were responsible for all Jews across the world. Um, there are like local councils, but not anything like a, okay, from Jerusalem, the word's gone out and Paul's going to go out and persecute Christians. Paul's going to go out and persecute these people who say they're Jews, but they're following Jesus. Um, Whatever Paul was doing probably has something to do with the fact that um, in all those local areas, there's a lot of struggle about what it means to be a faithful Jew at this point. Um, and, and he's probably really aggressively going after people who disagree with him and his people about what it means to be a Jew. Um, and, what, and whether Jews can believe, whether faithful Jews can believe in Jesus is a live question at this point. Because there are some churches that appear to be sort of either just separated from synagogues or still sort of in synagogues that people are writing to in the first century. There are others that have sort of made a clear separation and are doing their own thing. Um, the other thing I think, Brad, I'm dancing around this question because there's not a good answer to it. But the, <laughs> the other thing I think is important is one of the things that's pretty clearly agreed on is that Paul after he has this mystical experience of Jesus from fairly early on, sees himself as an apostle to the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so Paul's primary work after whenever that vision is, is going to be not sort of convincing Jews to believe in Jesus nearly so much as it is going out and, and saying to Gentiles, some of whom might be interested in the Jewish faith, but who are not Jews by birth, um, that, that there is salvation in Jesus, there's salvation in Christ or something like that. Uh, and that, that creates some turmoil in local areas. And that's in fact, one of the reasons why whatever persecution there is in the first century, it has to do with the fact that Rome doesn't like turmoil. So if it turns out that Paul or somebody following Paul or somebody preaching Jesus winds up coming into town and stirring things up, Rome's not a big fan of that. And Judaism has some status in, in the Roman world as an ancient religion that, that what's going to become Christianity doesn't have. Rome also doesn't like new stuff. They'd rather have old stuff. So, and he was also a Roman, a Roman citizen too, which sometimes we tend to forget. Right? That's right. Acts says that he was a Roman citizen. Yeah. And, and, and I, think, I think it's important to delineate that Paul was not acting on Roman authority. Right. At any point, most likely. So he, yeah. even if he has that citizenship status, he's not um, he's not sort of working for Rome. There's yeah. some sort of internal struggle that that he's taken some part in. Um, so I think if I remember from what I've read, there was a tax issue too, right? There was the politics of tax because you, if you were going to do your own thing, the Romans still wanted you to pay taxes, support pagan rituals and all that other stuff. Am I correct in remembering that? I th that there is, I'm, I'm not well educated enough about um, the late antique period to know exactly that tax issue, although I know scholars have written about that. I think what I, yeah, I think what I would say about that is that just, just to underscore that Rome doesn't like turmoil at all, and that one of the live questions in Judaism at this point, it, it appears, is, um, is Judaism exclusive? So that's to say, if you pay taxes to Caesar and, and in the Roman sort of ethos, Caesar is a kind of God, then is that a problem? And that's not 
why I keep saying before every class, remember that what it means to be a Jew and what it means to be a Christian is not settled at this point. I, I mean, it's not settled this point, the point in which we're sitting, but it's certainly not settled in the first century. And the reason that's so important is because um, the, the, there are a bunch of live questions that we assume the answers to that are still questions at the time that Paul is preaching and writing. And, and what it means to be a faithful Jew and or a faithful Christ believer is still way up in the air, way up in the air. Is it possible that what Paul was doing in some way conflicted with what other disciples, Peter, and others were doing? Because you have said several times there isn't a Christianity at all at this point. There are in, are you saying really there are ultimate, there are different movements taking place. Nelson, can you see the delight spreading on my face as you ask that question? Um, there, there's, a, there's a scholarly debate about that, but what I think seems the most likely is that Paul and Peter had a really hard time getting along, way more so than the Acts of the Apostles, for example, would bring to the forefront. Because it seems like later Christian documents, one of the things they're trying to do is bring Paul and Peter back together in the late first and early second centuries of the church. And you can see why, right? Like if Christianity is becoming a thing, then the early leaders of the tradition really didn't get along with each other. That's, that's a bit of a problem. So a lot of people think that one of the reasons that Acts is written in the way that it's written is to say, well, look, they never really were that far apart. And I don't think Paul and Peter would have agreed with that. So there's like Paul's Christianity and there's Peter's Christianity. There's probably James of Jerusalem is, is somewhere in there, is a really significant early figure um, who's the said to be the brother of Jesus. And all, all of that arguing is also going on in the background. So you, we don't see nearly as much of that in Philippians as in Galatians, for example, but Paul sort of lays out in Galatians what happens when he met Peter for a meeting. And it, it sounds really ugly. Like if you, if you sort of read in the background of Galatians, it sounds like Paul and Peter really had a falling out. Now, whether they sort of brought it back together, that, I mean, who knows? That's a really open question. But it's definitely good to be thinking about the fact that Paul's people may not be thinking the same things about Jesus that Peter's people are thinking in 50 or 60. And I would argue that's one of the things that makes the New Testament so interesting and so fruitful for our continued study. It's just not just where we came from, and it's not just God sort of teaching us an approach to the world through these, through these writings that have been handed down to us, but it also helps us understand just how diverse the early church was, which is instructive for us when we think about how to get along with people who might think differently than we do perspective seems to be a huge issue. I mean, in this case, we pretty much know the authorship <clears throat> of the letter. So, you know, we don't have to worry about the perspective of, of what the tr true author was really trying to bring about. In this case, it's Paul. But you also have to ha understand a little bit about the perspective of who he's writing the letter to. And it's a mixed bag of people. It is, uh, you know, Jewish people that are coming into the face and non-Jewish people who are coming into the face. And, and how you uh, aim that argument that you're making toward them, you not only have that, but you have uh, editors who put together the New Testament. What were they thinking when they included that? And, you know, and then we have the modern church and then you have an idiot like me who's sitting there looking at all this, wondering what the heck is he really talking about here? So perspective to me is, is the biggest challenge in trying to follow what's going on in these letters. I think you're right, Greg. And I think if you all probably know me well enough in terms of teaching by now to know that one rough way of dealing with those, that whole series of questions in the last 200 years in the American context has been, well, God wrote it all, don't worry about it. And I think that's not super helpful um, I think that 
actually digging in and studying these things and finding out what historians and theologians bring to bear on them uh, enriches our understanding of all the different ways in which believing in Jesus took its shape in the first century and how that may have something to say for us today. Um, I think perspective is crucial, and not just in the first century, as you say, but these texts were selected to be handed down for a reason. Thinking about that is also important. People have kept reading them for 2,000 years. Thinking about how they've worked themselves out in different people's lives is important. There's such a big difference between where, where Peter was and where Paul was, because Peter lived and knew Jesus as a friend. So his investment was, I knew this person, where Paul didn't have that. Paul's life didn't pick up till after the crucifixion. And, and so that's where his life began, and that's where his focus starts. Is that not correct? Oh, yeah. In fact, it appears that one of the primary disagreements among what are sometimes called the Jerusalem apostles and Paul is Paul says, well, you know, I've got this mission. Christ appeared to me too. And they said, I don't, I don't know if that's true. They actually seem to have had some pretty serious disagreement about whether Paul, about just what authority Paul should have because he hadn't seen Jesus on earth. The only Jesus that Paul saw was the risen Christ. And that's, Paul says that. Paul, Paul never claims to have met Jesus in person while Jesus was walking around. So that's one of those real live questions. Just, just what authority should Paul have? And whatever the Jerusalem apostles thought about what authority Paul should have, it seems pretty clear that Paul is, uh, second to Jesus, the most significant figure in first century Christianity. Whether people thought he should have been or not, half the New Testament, uh, well, probably more than half the New Testament, is either by Paul or by people who disagreed with him and are saying Paul's wrong. And I think we ought to pay attention to that. Okay. We have like four minutes left to do the first chapter of Philippians, but that's good. That's good. Will somebody just feel free, anybody, to unmute yourself and read this, this first slide of text? Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ, Jesus who are in, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and de deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. So here's what I see in this text. Paul doesn't call himself an apostle here, and that's odd from the rest of his letters. But apparently what he's trying to do is remind the Philippians how close they are. He's not, he's not writing them about his authority. He's writing them about his friendship and about their friendship with him. Because there doesn't seem to be the same level of struggle in the Philippian church as with some of Paul's other churches. Um, he, he talks about saints, and we've talked a lot about the word saints, um, holy ones. And Paul's using that term now to describe Christians in a way that's fascinating. Um, people who are sort of, yeah, God, God's special people in some way. And there's a long history of that word uh, that I don't have time to talk about too much right now. He also uses the word bishops here. And it, it's not clear that it, he certainly doesn't mean bishop in the way that we think about it. That's a later development. But this is, I think, the first use of this term in the New Testament. And one of the things it shows is that the church is starting, starting to figure out how to order itself in the absence of kind of located apostles. So Paul's not going to be here. Paul's writing us letters. But how are we going to organize ourselves in the meantime? Um, and so this, this word bishop, which also can mean like a, an overseer, somebody who's tasked to, to administer, uh, this is the first time it's used in the New Testament, but it's not the last. And then grace to you and peace is a standard uh, Jewish greeting in in letters. It's not used in quite the same way in Greek literature as it is in some Jewish letters that we have. Joe, would there have been Jewish people in Philippi or would it be strictly Gentiles? There would have been a community of, of Jews in Philippi. Okay. I don't know that we know 
a whole lot about that community. I think there is some some um, archaeological evidence, like some inscriptions and things like that. There, I'm, I'm almost certain that there was a synagogue in Philippi. But one of those real questions, Suzanne, is when Acts says when Paul goes into town, he always starts at the synagogue. But it could be the case that that's one of those times when Acts is trying to make Paul look more like Peter. Because Paul seems really clear that his mission is to Gentiles. That's who Paul is going out to get, is the Gentiles. Um, so how closely Paul's community in Philippi would have been connected to the synagogue is not at all clear. Um, there may be Jewish folks in the, in the community that Paul is writing to, Jewish folks who, are not Christ, who had not been Christ believers, but I, it would be very few, probably. In other words, Paul's community here is probably not in the synagogue. All right. It was very striking to me when you showed the map how far Paul had traveled from Damascus to Philippi to Rome in, with the limited forms of transportation and the length of time it took to go and see and where all of his letters were going. Yep. I think that's really important to pay attention to. That's one of those things that is so different from the modern conception of what it means to be connected. Because um, it's, it's like walking, rudimentary vehicle transportation and ships. And in fact, Axe has this really charming story about Paul being in a shipwreck um, on the Mediterranean, sort of along one of his journeys. Uh, but it's not terribly easy to get from place to place. The Romans have made it easier. So there's a road from Rome to Philippi called the Via Ignatia. And so you can walk it, but that's a very long way to walk, right? Like I don't have the exact distances in my head, but I think that's probably something like walking from here to uh, DC, maybe something like that. Maybe a little less than that. Could be like Southern Virginia, but that that's significant, which is one reason why this letter writing is so important. And Paul's really the originator of the idea of a Christian letter. The earliest documents that we have are those letters that Paul starts writing. Uh, but that it's not clear that that was a common practice before him. All right, who wants to read next? I will. I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to think this way about all of you because you hold me in your heart. For all of you share in God's grace with me, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I long for all of you with the compassion of Christ Jesus. Thank you. I thank my God. Um, a lot of people will flag this as a marker that Paul expects this to be read in, the, in what we would call the liturgy. So when the church gets together, uh, Paul has, has some experience of synagogue worship where they gather to read the Torah, right, and to read the writings. And it seems that Paul expects this letter to be read, read out. So I think my God is not just a thanksgiving. It's kind of a, it's, it's a form that flags for us that he's expecting people, this to be read to people. Uh, and every time I remember you, he says. So remember, if this is a consolation letter, uh, there are some ancient Greek phil philosophical schools, and one of them is Epicureanism. Have you ever heard of that? to be an Epicurean. So Stoics are people who roughly would say when, you, when you're up against trouble, well, just don't feel anything. If you just don't feel anything, it won't hurt. And Epicurean, that, that's really rough. Like I like Stoicism, but that, that's basically what, they, what, they're, what they're using. Epicureans do the opposite. So they say, well, if you feel, you know, everybody's going to suffer, um, why don't you think about something pleasant? and distract yourself from the suffering, 
roughly speaking. So that's why we would still talk about people who are Epicureans as people who enjoy the finer things as a way of not focusing on suffering. Uh, and so this is typical Epicurean consolation. Paul says, you know, I know there's a lot going on and I know I'm in prison. See, he says it down here, my imprisonment. And he says, I just, uh, when, I, when I think about you all, I'm just delighted. I just thank God every, for every memory I have of you. So he's, he's already doing this kind of consoling thing, right? He talks about their sharing in the gospel. And this is both, I think, uh, them being sort of committed followers of the gospel uh, following Paul, but also that gift. Remember, they sent him some kind of gift that we're going to see a few chapters down. And this is the longest Thanksgiving in Paul's letters. So the, he, he just goes on and on about how thankful he is for the Philippians. And it's especially striking when you compare that to Galatians, for example, where Paul's pretty upset when he's writing the Galatians, and he doesn't even thank God for them at all. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and he says a couple other things. <laughs> and then instead of thanking God, he says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the gospel. That's how he starts the letter. As opposed to here, where he just goes on and on about Paul's thanksgiving, about thanking God for them, which flags for us that Paul's writing with the expectation that they're with him. He's not putting down conflict in the same way. He's just consoling them. He's bringing them along with him. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave the rest because I'm, I'm aware of the time. Anything else before we move on? Just real quick is um, where he says, I am confident of this, <laughs> that the one who began, is that he's talking about Timothy or somebody in the community there? He's talking about God. God who began a good work in you. That's a great question. Um, because God's the one who began the work. God's the one who's going to bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. I'll say more about the day of Christ on the next slide. But um, Paul's, Paul's reassuring them in a sense that if, in fact, he's correct and they're correct and he doesn't make it out of prison, God's still going to keep doing God's thing. Um, which, is, I mean, that's one of those things that makes this letter timeless. Like. It would repay us all to meditate on the idea that God's work in us will be continued no matter what happens. And it's one thing for us to say that with like an established church, right? It's one thing for us to say that with a pretty stable existence. And it's quite another for Paul to say that to a group of people who think, well, if Paul goes, do we have anything left? And he says, yeah. God started the work. God will finish the work. Who's next? I'll read. And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you to determine what is best, so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. Thank you. A harvest of righteousness. That's such a great phrase. Stop for a second and appreciate that phrase. So Paul wants their love to abound in knowledge. So you'll hear me say this in the sermon. You know, let me say this probably every day of my Christian life, but love is not amorphous for, for Paul or for really anybody who's thinking about love at this point in the context of the New Testament. So Paul wants their love to, to be more and more knowledgeable. Um, and that's really important because of the next thing that he says, knowledge and full insight to help you determine what is best. So this is classic Greco-Roman consolation, stoic consolation, in fact, because what Paul says is, I want you to focus on the things that matter. And you know what doesn't matter? Me being in prison. Doesn't matter if I'm killed. Doesn't matter if you suffer. What you need to focus on is what really matters. So Paul says, I want your love to get better and better at recognizing what really matters. Because again, he's preparing them for a future without him is what seems to be happening. 
So don't get distracted by the things that don't matter. So that, he says, in the day of Christ, you may be pure and blameless. Anybody in this class had uh, done any study at all with Becky Wright? Yeah, you know Becky Wright's group. Even if you don't, you will have heard one of us teaching the Bible at some point talk about the day of the Lord and the prophets. So the day of the Lord and the prophets the, in the Hebrew Bible is this sort of cataclysmic last day when God's finally going to judge the world. And it's important to remember that even as Paul develops his thought about sort of what's going to happen to him, what's going to happen to the Philippians after he goes, he still has in mind this day this sort of final day, and that's the day of Christ. And so Paul says when that day comes, you need to have focused on what matters so that you can be ready for it, so that you can be pure and blameless. And he's got some strategies for that, which again is why continuing to read this letter has proven helpful for Christians down through the ages for the last 2,000 years. Okay, I'm going to do one more at least. Who wants to read? I want you to know that what has happened has actually helped to spread the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers and sisters, having been made confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, Dare to speak the word with greater boldness and without fear. Okay, go ahead and read the next slide because that those kind of go together. Um, I, yes, I, I can't see quite all the words. Um, oh. That's better. Some proclaim Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. These proclaim Christ out of love, knowing that I have been put here for the defense of the gospel. The others proclaim, proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition not sincerely, but intending to increase my suffering and my imprisonment. What does it matter? Just this, that Christ is proclaimed in every way, whether out of false motives or true, and in that I rejoice. Thank you. So here we get a, a little bit of the sense of that conflict creeping in, but not necessarily in Philippi. So Paul's talking about, if he's writing from Rome, uh, we know from Romans that Paul is, is sort of at odds with some people in Rome about what the gospel really is. And so the people who are proclaiming Christ from envy and rivalry, we don't know exactly what that means. Um, but it's not necessarily that the Philippian church is having a problem. It could be that Paul's sort of around folks who are making it worse for him by sort of bickering with him or with his churches about what the what the truth is what the gospel is but he then brings it right back around and he says see this question at the bottom of the slide what does it matter remember that he's just told them a few verses ago i want you to focus on what really matters and he says that conflict is not what matters what matters is that christ is preached in every way and in that i rejoice so see how he's He's saying this could be a cause for, for suffering or for distress, but it doesn't matter. And again, he's consoling them by saying what matters is Jesus and nothing else. Okay. I want to leave time for last minute questions and comments. So I'm going to stop right there. Tommy, I know you're, let me stop sharing here. I know you're out there somewhere. Uh, you and I will circle back and touch base this afternoon or tomorrow about whether you want to pick up here. Uh, Tommy's going to teach next week as a way of getting some uh, rector's forum teaching experience um, when he can't come down here. And so I'm excited about that. And Tommy will talk about where to pick up. All right. Any questions, anybody? I'm going to flip it to Brad in just a minute for prayer reports and so forth. But we've got time for a couple of comments or observations. Is this way of teaching helpful? I know this is kind of a departure from the last couple of studies that we've done on Zoom. Uh, I know, and so I know that I'm talking 
in larger proportion to the last studies that we've done. So it's okay for me to see a lot of this, in which case I can do some recalibrating. Now, this has been very helpful. And, I, and the, last, um, the last bit about saying it doesn't matter, just Jesus matters, even though there's all this power grab stuff happening at the time, is really interesting. It'd be nice to talk about that further down the road. Hmm. I think that um, this, was, this was down my list to talk about, because Paul's going to start actually addressing suffering in a little more detail in a few verses. But it's important to remember how differently the world is shaped um, today than it was then. And I think particularly about the fact that as a general rule, and, and I, I'm, very, I'm very carefully saying this because I don't mean to indicate that, that we don't suffer in the same way, not at all. As a general rule, suffering when it comes to us is more of a surprise than it would have been in the ancient world because we have simple things like antibiotics. I mean, I just, I don't think you can overstate the importance of penicillin in the stability of sort of modern life. Things like that are a development that's not even imagined by Paul or, or Greco-Roman thinkers or Jewish thinkers, anybody at this time. So I would argue that, that suffering is a, um, is more of the more of the fabric of life than it is at that point. It's just assumed that it's kind of always happening. And one of the gifts I think that gives for us um, is that when we are confronted with suffering, whether it surprises us more or not, there's this rich tradition of people whose lives were were really hard reflecting on what God's love means in those circumstances. Um, and so. What does it matter? Sounds like it could be a kind of waving away of suffering in a way that I think we we all general we all try to know better than to do. We try not to dismiss people's suffering by saying, "Well, think of it this way," or "Oh, that happened to me once," or whatever. And we see we see Paul laying out here some ideas about how to confront suffering in a way that it doesn't wind up totally running your life. And that's really important. That's really important. Because whether it comes as a surprise to us or not, I think one thing that we can be really clear about, given all of human history and experience, is that, that suffering is in some sense part of human life. And sometimes the harder you try to avoid it, the more shocking it is when it comes. And so Paul is, Paul's got some ideas. He's got some ideas about how to deal with that. Joe, thank you for this. As always, just, um, I just learned so much when, uh, when you're teaching. So lo really looking forward to the rest of this and Tommy, looking forward to you next week. Um, the folks 